Welcome back to Elder Sign, a weird fiction podcast by Clay Temple Media. I'm Brandon Buddha. And I'm Glenn McDorman. This episode, we are talking about an authentic narrative of a haunted house by Sheridan Le Fanu, which was a story originally published in 1862 in the Dublin University magazine, of which Le Fanu was also the editor. That's a, a good trick. I think we need to start doing that. But before we get into the main attraction today, we want to let you guys know about a brand new show on the network. Brent Helt and I are doing a Neil Gaiman podcast that we're calling Hanging Out with the Dream King, and we've just released our first three episodes. The real impetus behind this show is that Brent and I have been friends for over 35 years, and we just wanted to revisit the dream of the 90s when we were in high school and reading every Neil Gaiman book that we could get our hands on. So we're starting with The Sandman, which uh, I think everyone agrees is a real masterpiece. And we'll take a few years on that, and then we'll we'll go from there. And just like this show, of course, you don't have to read along to enjoy the episodes. And I really hope you'll check it out. Yeah, I'm really excited for this to start airing, because I plan to read along. It'll give me an excuse to rebuy uh, the first two uh, Sandman books, which I lent out to somebody, and I can't remember who, and I'm probably never going to get them back. So uh, I'm excited to to start again from the beginning and, and read along with you guys. I can't wait. Yeah, those first two books, those are the ones that I think most people feel like, yeah, you could give those away and not get them back and it's fine. You want to start with book three. It's like Star Trek The Next Generation. You want to start with season three. But actually, Brent and I have found that we really loved the first two books. Uh, I guess, spoiler, we've already recorded all of those episodes, but we really loved them. And uh, I think it will be a lot of fun to have other people revisiting those with us and discovering that uh, again as well. Well, let's get to the, the story at hand here in this episode. This is our first trip back to the 19th century in quite a while. And it's also our first ghost story since we did M.R. James's Lost Hearts, which was like our third episode. So it's a Victorian ghost story from an Anglo-Irish writer, uh, which as a descriptor really interests me, at least historically. And I, I tend to love the writing style of these uh, 19th century writers as well. But it is an early ghost story. And I'm not really sure how successful it is by our contemporary standards. And so I think we're going to end up talking about how we might write this story differently today. But that is getting ahead of ourselves. So let's get into the recap first. And that is your job this week, Brandon. So engage. <laughs> All right. The narrative begins with an editor's note from the editor of the University Magazine. The editor implores the reader to take the narrative that they are about to read as true. The editor has done his homework and can fully vouch for the authenticity of this narrative and the character of the narrator and the other real people whose names have been changed to protect the innocent who have witnessed the events of this story. The editor would especially like to point out that this story is not an elaborate hoax or trick, as in the ghost of Mrs. Veal or the apparition of Mrs. Veal, which was a, a, a pamphlet that was published uh, prior to the release of this story, um, often attributed to Daniel Defoe. And he and the editor wants the reader to take the evidence in this story at face value. The narrative, he believes here, could hold up in a court of law, given the character of the witnesses. This is a, a fairly classic trope, right? This opening here, this insistence that this is not a work of fiction, but is in fact the very true account of something strange and mysterious that very definitely, really super definitely happened. It's a common trope, especially in the 19th century. But here, Le Fanu dials it up to maybe not 11, but at least to nine, I think, with his insistence that these witnesses are all reputable and that this account, yeah, is basically a legal affidavit. It's an interesting twist on this trope. And what follows is actually going to read a little bit like a legal affidavit. And that may be one of the problems with the, the story. I agree. And I can't wait to talk about some of the some of the technique choices in the discussion. All right. Now the narrative begins in earnest. A husband and father of three at some point within the past eight years was ordered by his doctor to move to the coast because his health was poor. We'll learn throughout the story that he and his wife are both invalids and have a lot of mysterious ailments. So this man found a house, uh, a row home, and they him and his family and his servants live in it for uh, about a year. The house appears to be quite modern, which is important because nobody thinks of ghosts as haunting new houses. The children's ages are nine, six, and seven. And the family has also brought along six of their servants. There's the nurse, Mrs. Sutherland, a nursery maid named Ellen Page, 
Mrs. Greenwood, the cook, a housemaid, Ellen Faith, Smith, the butler, and a son, James, who also works in the stables. He's about 22 or 23. Right away, we get just another classic haunted house trope. Though, of course, they're not quite classic tropes here in the 19th century. I mean, this is Le Fanu, among others, you know, inventing what this genre is going to become. But right, this house is new to the family who have come for reasons. Uh, you know, sometimes it's a job change. Sometimes it's because your teenage kid got kicked out of school. Sometimes it's to save your marriage. But in this case, as it almost always is in these 19th century stories, it's because the narrator is in poor health and needs some country air. But even as we have this trope, as you say, Brandon Le Fanu does subvert some of our expectations about what a haunted house is by really emphasizing how new and modern this house is, right? Because there aren't any old tragedies here because it's a new house. One more thing I do want to say before we get to the actual haunting here is simply that this is not a middle class family, right? These people are wealthy. They're able to rent large houses on a whim because they need to take time off to recover from whatever mysterious ailment they have that will just be cured by breathing better. And they all have servants. Every member of the family has like a personal servant. Uh, No one has any actual work to do. We have no sense even of where like the family money comes from. I mean, often this is a doctor or a lawyer, someone who can take time off, but that doesn't even seem to be the case here. And of course, this is also a trope of 19th century literature because that class of people is the audience for these stories. These are the people who have the excess income, the disposable income to subscribe to the Dublin University magazine and so on. Yeah, it's a big feature of this story, the fact that these people are upper class. The, the, there's an implicit assumption in the telling of this story that the narrator being upper class is able to vouch for the truth of the statements of all of his servants because he can vouch for them being truthful, good people, not superstitious and all this stuff. And it's it, it kind of reads really strange in today's society for me uh, how much effort Lafanu puts into letting us know how wealthy this man is and how trustworthy he is as a result. And we're going to see this class element when we get to the actual haunting as well. And of course, in Ireland in the 19th century, you know, class, uh, thinking of, of economic class and social status as, as real things that, that we as Americans have trouble understanding. And of course, it's, this is also a century and a half ago. But in Ireland, of course, there is also always a religious element to this as well, a Protestant versus Catholic element. And I think we're going to see some of that here as well. And I think that when Le Fanu is talking about how the servants, he can vouch that they're not superstitious, it's... This is something he has to say repeatedly because the servants being poor are also Catholic, whereas the, the family that is renting the house are Anglo-Irish. They're, they're Protestants. I think that's right. Well, on the first night after getting settled, uh, getting moved in and situated, the narrator, who is again an invalid, had resigned himself to go to bed. And so he's climbing the stairs to his room. His wife is already in bed. And she's already dismissed her maid. And they hear the husband and wife in their separate locations, a wild scream from the nurse's room. So he goes to the nurse's room to see what's wrong. And the nurse reports that an unnaturally tall figure had been standing next to her bed. So the man and his wife try to convince the nurse that the nurse's vision was the result of, you know, living in a new place or shadows cast by the bed curtains, just unfamiliarity with her surroundings, but the nurse is insistent upon what she has seen. Within the next day or so, the servants come under the belief that thieves had established a secret mode of access to the lower part of the house. Perhaps they'd built smuggling tunnels or something like that. And and they believe this because Smith, who's the butler, has seen an ill-looking woman in his room. And other servants have seen something similar lurking around the house. No one here is suggesting anything superstitious has happened. There's no hypotheses other than the fact that somebody is trying to break into the house or living in the house illegally. But the men of the house perform a a search of the grounds and the foundation, and they don't find any smuggler tunnels. They find nothing. And now the servants are beginning to become a little wary of what's going on. So the narrator decides to get a testimony from his trusty butler, Smith. And Smith 
tells that he was laying awake one night in his room, and as people do, he had many things on his mind, uh, which is just an odd sort of thing. I don't know why we need to justify him laying awake at night. <laughs> Smith was facing the wall, you know, laying on his side, and he sees a light somewhere emanating from the room behind him. So he turns around in his bed, and he sees this ratchet-looking woman. She is wearing a bonnet and a ragged dress, and she seems to be rummaging around for something on the floor. The old woman turns around, and the light that Smith saw is like this reddish glow of coal, he describes it as, and it's coming from her hand. Smith describes the woman's face as pitted with smallpox scars, and she's blind in one eye, which means she is missing an eye. Smith doesn't really think anything of this. He just thinks, oh, well, this is the woman that was left in charge of the house by the proprietor, and she just stayed behind and stayed on with the female servants. So he coughs politely to let her know that he's there, and he turns back to the wall. This is of all, another very bizarre interaction to me. I mean, if somebody's like rummaging around in my room at night, uh, I, I don't like just cough to alert them of my presence and then turn around and not, not continue on. It's very strange. Yeah, this is some of this 19th century propriety that just doesn't make any sense to us. Uh, and, and also perhaps as Americans as well. Uh, of course, this is something that's been much on my mind lately because we're rewatching Buffy the Vampire Slayer and there are so many gags about Giles, the very English librarian, having to deal with all these uh, ridiculous, absurd American teenagers. <laughs> right. Uh, well, when, the, when Smith turns around again, both the woman and the the red glowing light are gone. The next morning, Smith asks around a little bit, and he finds out that the per- that the proprietor had left nobody behind. He didn't leave his servant or maid behind to to work on the house. The narrator presses the butler on all of his claims, but the butler insists that this is exactly as it happened. It strikes the narrator now that, considering how prone to superstition persons in the servant class usually are, the butler didn't attribute the incident to anything supernatural. Far from it. Uh, And in fact, the butler sees the woman again after church on Sunday, though she disappears before he can catch up with her. But when he asks around in the congregation, no, no one else had seen her or noticed that she was there. More strange things happen. Next, the cook and the housemaid experience odd shadows in their room. They're constantly aware of a shadow moving across uh, the wall opposite of their beds. And they didn't know what to do about it other than to move the candle right up against the wall so that nothing could cast a shadow on the wall. Nothing could pass between the candle and the wall. But that didn't make a difference. The shadow, as they reported, seemed to have no relation to the position of the light. It's very, very spooky. Other strange things continue to happen in the nursery. The handle of the door shimmies and jiggles a lot. There's a lot of knocking at the door that ceased whenever anybody calls out, who's there? Um, And no one ever was there at the door. And in case you were wondering, the nurse, though she's of a lower class, is an extremely trustworthy servant. And the narrator has no reason to doubt her word. Now the narrator begins to experience some of these odd events. He reports that he had seen this strange woman. The woman came in through the front garden, through the iron gate that that separates that garden from the public road. And he just wanted to talk to her to clear up the matter. But he can't walk because he's got a lame foot. So he gets up and tries to move around to get his servant bell to ring for Smith. And he did does this quietly because based on how the woman is moving, he felt that he shouldn't alert her to his presence, the fact that he's watching her. He couldn't get to the bell quickly enough, though. And by the time he rings for Smith and Smith arrives, the woman has left. So he sends Smith out on a foot chase, but Smith can't find this woman anywhere. She's disappeared, even though she's a very old woman. Next, we get a report from the narrator's wife, who was confined to her bed, being an invalid. And the wife frequently heard knocking on the timbers of the roof that there's no explanation for. They asked the neighbors if they were doing housework. It's a row home. You hear stuff. Um, But the neighbors haven't been doing any work on their houses. And, of course, no one speaks of these things in front of the children. 
But that doesn't mean that the children are immune to these strange events. They frequently saw this woman in the back garden where they played um, near the stable wall, stooping over the ground. And the one-eyed woman, the blind woman that Smith has seen, is always in the same plot. And it's clear now that everybody is seeing this woman in the house. We also get a note here uh, about about James, since we introduced him earlier on in the story, he has to have an experience. He's working in the stables, and the family mayor uh, seems to be suffering from <laughs> extreme fear. So it's just, yeah. yeah, that's all we get about his. He's, he's got a scared horse on his hands. Yeah, usually in a haunted house story, this is a cat or a dog. But here it's the horse who can know what's up, can see the ghosts when even the, the humans can't. Uh, I, I think there's a good reason we switch to cats and dogs. Yeah, uh, the scared horse in the stable doesn't really carry that much weight here in the story. Uh, Well, one morning, the narrator's eldest child, which is to say the most trustworthy, uh, reported that robbers had broken into the nursery. A small man with a red face and an oddly cut frock coat uh, who wears boots covered in mud stood around the nursery for a while and then began rummaging around before leaving. The child was terrified, rightly so, and based on how good of a witness they are, how good of a witness statement they gave their father, the father has no reason to doubt that they're doing anything other than reporting the truth. So the narrator, the father, examines everything he owns in the house, only to discover that nothing has been taken or even disturbed. Smith and the narrator are convinced That all of this business is designed to make them believe that the house is haunted so that they would just vacate the home. But they still can't explain the presence of the shadow in the cook and nursemaid's room. Well, because this whole family seems to be sick in some way, the narrator has some some physicians come out. uh, And the physicians suggest uh, that they burn a candle at all times in the lobby. And this is, as La Fanu describes, an old woman's recipe against ghosts. And this works for about three or four nights. But after that, everything, all of the odd events return in full force. Now the seven-year-old has her own experiences in the nursery. She sees a young woman with black hair and a black coat standing in the middle of the floor. The woman looked pale and both, quote, sorry and frightened. She looked dead to the child. Furthermore, there was a dark streak across the woman's throat, like a scar with blood upon it. One day, a few days later, the narrator asks his children to show him the spot where the one-eyed woman often stood and scrabbled around in the dirt. All of the children knew the exact point of the spot, which means that they can corroborate one another's story, which means it must be true because children don't get caught up, caught up in fantasies ever. <laughs> No, they're always the most reliable narrators you can possibly have. They never confuse their imagination and suppositions with what's really happening. (laughs) No, no, I've never never heard of such a thing. (laughs) Well, the narrator suggests to his children that they should just dig up the spot because he can't really do anything because he's an invalid and, and just see what they can find. And so the children spend the whole day digging in the spot where this old creepy woman, woman stands and watches them play. By the evening, the children return to their father with a piece of uh, rotted jawbone with several teeth still intact. And one of the physicians was able to confirm that they were that this is indeed human remains. Right. And so this brings us to the the end of the actual haunting narrative. Now we're going to get the conclusion where we're going to try to piece together what's actually going on, what or who has been haunting the house and why the the explanation stuff that we always, you know, yearn for in these haunted house stories. I found that Le Fanu took two interesting tacks right at the beginning of the narrative of the supernatural events going on in the house, right? The first is that everyone in the house, the the married couple, their kids, the servants, everyone sees a a strange and poor old woman who has led a rough life. Uh, You know, she's got pox scars and and so on. She's a very poor woman and they see her all over the house. They even also maybe see her at church so like out of the house as well that we never get anything more about that that seems to be maybe breaking the rules a little bit to me but the other tack that lefanu takes here is that the inhabitants of the house are certain that robbers are somehow sneaking into the house at night even though nothing is going missing 
but they think this because some of the other people, the servants and so on, are, are also seen a strange man in the house. And what I find interesting here is that no one associates the old woman with robbery, right? There's a gendered response to these spectral strangers showing up in the house. People pity the woman, but they suspect the man. And when faced even with the lack of evidence of any actual robbery, the assumption becomes that the man must be up to some other scheme, right? That he's trying to scare them out of the house or something like that. But the woman is just left out of these equations all together. This is a very interesting gender dynamic going on here that I don't think ever amounts to anything, ever comes to any fruition. Right. It's very much like a, a Scooby-Doo type of plot, haunted house plot here, that the there aren't, nobody really believes that there are any ghosts. It's just, you know, old man Carruthers, uh, he was trying to save his carnival or something like <laughs> yeah. that. You know, it doesn't really make any sense. There's no motivation for, for any of this haunting and uh, no nobody really associates the odd events with the fact that uh, a strange man just stands in the children's bedroom at night and nobody's like posting a guard. Nobody's making the butler sleep in the kid's room and moving the nurse there. Nothing is happening here. It's just like, uh, well, this is a really practical thing that's happening. Uh, let's just see how it plays out. It's crazy to me, the the lack of motivation in any of these characters to really investigate. And that's going to come through at the very end of the story, too. Right. Now we have this jawbone that they have dug up in their, their backyard, this human jawbone. So let, let's get there, Brandon. Tell us what happens, what becomes of this jawbone. Yeah. Well, the narrator takes a moment before continuing on to reflect upon this whole matter. And he is convinced of the truth of it, though the truth doesn't seem to have any really corresponding relationship to action in reality, as we've kind of been talking about. Uh, So many trustworthy people, including himself, all report similar experiences in this house. And nothing like this has happened to him before or since this stay at this house. He doesn't want to believe in ghosts, but he's really just at a loss for any other convincing explanation of the phenomena he experienced. Well, that that's his reflection on the whole matter, but we get a little coda here. After the discovery of the teeth and jawbone, the narrator speaks to an old man who might just be old man Carruthers here. <laughs> and, uh, this this guy's a friend of the family as well. And this old man remembers the town in which they had taken residence. The old man poo-poos the haunting story. And so the narrator offers a sort of story to help explain it, a kind of thought experiment. The narrator says to the old man that they could assign each ghostly figure a role in some sort of tragedy that had been played out in the house. The male figure is the murderer. The one-eyed woman is his accomplice who buried the body, which is why she's always scratching in the dirt. And the murder victim is the black-haired woman herself. But one thing the narrator can't understand is how such a haunting could occur in such a modern and recently built house. But the old man can't explain that. The house is, in fact, not modern at all. The row homes... there in that area used to make up a government store and were recently refitted. They were gutted and rehabbed, though the building itself is very old. The old man says, I remember it well in my young days, 50 years ago, before the town had grown out in this direction at a more entirely lonely spot or one more fitted for the commission of a secret crime could not have been imagined. Soon after these events took place, The physician cleared the narrator's health, and they left the house on the coast. And the narrator just hasn't looked into the haunting any further, though he submits the puzzle to the reader to pursue if they so desire. And the story officially ends with the editor of the university magazine returning to vouch for the perfectly good faith and accuracy of the narrator. And this is it. This is the haunting. This is an entirely unsatisfying ending to this story. In the end, they find a human jawbone in the backyard. They don't do anything about that. They just go on living their lives for months and months, presumably while they're still seeing ghosts, but are just not motivated to do anything about it, to either figure out what's happening, to move or anything like that. And there's no consequence to any of that. 
and, but this turns out, this jawbone turns out to be the solution to the, the ghosts, right? The house may look new, but in fact, it's built on top of an ancient Indian burial ground. Uh, except that in this case, the ancient Indian burial ground is the Irish equivalent of that, which is to say it's an old government warehouse. And, and so the real mystery of the story turns out not to be why are there ghosts? What are ghosts? What are the ghosts up to? What should we do about them? But it's about how old this house they're living in actually is. And that doesn't satisfy anything because it's not really a puzzle that we're ever really sure. It's not something we're ever told is a puzzle. It does show up at the beginning, right? But it doesn't ever actually matter. So it's a very, very strange story. And I think that can just lead us straight into the discussion where I really just want to talk about the the tropes and the, the narrative techniques that Le Fanu employs here. And then I want to do a little bit of story doctoring. I tried to point out as we went through all of the, the classic ghost story tropes that Le Fanu is, is employing here, the ways that he's subverting them, and we do have a lot of them. There are probably almost too many. I think if you're going to write a ghost story today, you don't throw every single trope at it, unless what you're doing is a metafictional story about what ghost stories are. But otherwise, you pick maybe one or two. You try to pick two that have never been put together before, or you subvert one of them, something like that. But Le Fanu here is throwing most of them as they existed in the 19th century, into this story. But then we also have the the way that he tells this story is, you know, entirely in retrospect, by so in the first person, by someone who lived through this haunting, but who doesn't seem to actually care that it happened. There's never here any sense of danger, right? No one is ever in any danger in this story. And it doesn't seem that anyone was ever afraid of anything either, right? So I guess the question that I have for you, Brandon, here to get us started is, what emotions is Le Fanu attempting to elicit in his readers in this story, right? Is this even supposed to actually be a scary story? I wondered that as I was reading this story, uh, which was which was kind of a difficult read, really, for me. And, and it's, it's because it's so densely packed with information. But so little actually happens in way of plot. And there's a real dearth of character motivations here. And and so I wonder what's going on here if La Fanu isn't trying to make a sort of proto-documentary, like a proto-found footage story, in a sense, of the, the haunted house genre, of telling the story as if it were uh, sworn statements or affidavits and looking at it coldly and rationally and assuring the reader that these are good, thoughtful, well-educated people who know what empiricism is, and they know they have nothing to fear from ghosts, but strange stuff still happens that we don't have explanations for. And that that's about as much as I can imagine what's going on. I don't think the reader is supposed to feel scared. I don't think moving candles is scary or turning around in your bed is a particularly scary thing. And part of the reason is that is that even though there's a, a strange man climbing into the nursery at night, uh, the, none of the characters in the story are scared. So the reader can't f- feel that emotion. Our point of view character doesn't provide us with any emotion to hang on to. So I really wonder if he's just experimenting with form here and looking like what would uh, a factual, reflective, you know, eight or so years after the fact report of such a thing look like? All the emotions have already been worked out of the narrative through time and reflection. Um, and that, that's what I make of it. It's an odd technique for something that's supposed to be scary, but it's interesting in, uh, it's interesting in its formal attempts. Yeah, I don't think this is really meant to be scary at all. I actually think that this is a mystery story. This is meant to be a locked door mystery story, which is why we get so much attention paid to this whole idea that these are actually robbers who have some kind of secret tunnel entrance into one of the the, the storage pantries, you know, in the the sub basement level. None of which pans out, right? That uh, the at, the only thing in this story that actually amounts to an action sequence is when we're told that the servants have been put to work looking to see if anything's been stolen and looking to find secret entrances into the house. So this really reads more like a locked door mystery, right? The mystery here is that there are people in the house at night who shouldn't be in the house, 
But how did they get there, right? That's the mystery. And because we can't find any secret entrances, it turns out that uh, they must be actually ghosts. But then the mystery compounds because we all know that there can only be ghosts in old places, old buildings, but this isn't an old building. And so the solution to the locked door mystery is that, aha, it is actually an old building. You just didn't look into the property records when you decided to rent this house and let that be a lesson to you gentle reader you should always look at the property uh, the property records before you decide to rent an extravagant house for your family to live in but thank goodness you didn't actually buy this home you were only renting it so you can you can move on so it's not meant to be scary at all it is meant to be a puzzle from the the start but because nothing is ever at stake here, right? There are two problems here with the way that this narrative is told, right? One, there's no motive, but then also two, there's nothing at stake. And of course, motive and stakes are very much related to each other, right? Something can be at stake if you want, when you only really, when you want something, and then what's at stake is I might not get what I want, right? As a character, but we don't have it any of that here. Nothing matters. Doesn't matter if the characters do anything in this story. And it is written like this legal affidavit, right? And so it seems like this is, and so it seems like that right there could be what's the the motive for even telling the story is there's a legal matter to be cleared up. Here's our testimony, but he doesn't do that either. There's no crime here. No one's been accused of anything. He's not. It's not. He's not even trying to sell this house, or it's not that he bought the house and has discovered that uh, there are ghosts, and he's trying to invoke 19th century British Empire lemon laws or something like that. There's nothing at stake here in the telling of the story. And so it's devoid of any emotion. It is nothing other than an intellectual puzzle that is uh, neither much of a puzzle nor that intellectual. Yeah. I mean, I I think of stories like the Amityville Horror or uh, House of Leaves, things like that, that have similar tropes, even more recently, like The Conjuring, like the family moves to the house for, for reasons, and there are ghosts, and it's spooky. Everybody's actually scared and a little put off by it once they figure out what's going on, and then they have to solve the mystery in order to get rid of the ghost. But this is almost more like the inversion of that plot, like the family renting is the intruder somehow, and the ghosts are at home there. And maybe there's some commentary on on wealthy people renting homes here going on, where like they're the people who don't belong in these properties. But it's just it's just bizarre. It's something more like the others, where the the family are the intruders uh, and the ghosts in the house, and and they, they they have to leave in order for the ghosts to be at peace. Spoilers. Sorry, uh, if you haven't it's seen an old movie. a decade old movie to a decade and a half, but yeah, it's just it's something like that. But even that movie had like great mystery and and real subversion of tropes. This is really just like a like a boring true TV like ghost story reality show, like a true haunting, and it's it's just not. Yeah, there's no there's just no mystery here, which is what we've come to expect with ghost stories. Ghost stories are really just mysteries. Well, there's also not any solution here, right? I mean, I like how you connect this to The Others, which is one of my favorite ghost stories of all time. It's a magnificent movie, also fantastic score. But the idea there is that the people who lived in that house previously are still inhabiting the house in a, in a spiritual form as ghosts. But that it can't, isn't what's happening here because this wasn't a home before. It was a government warehouse that some people went to because of its isolated place in the countryside to commit some kind of crime. But we never get even a solution to the actual haunting. The only solution is, oh, the house is actually older than you think it is. The, the, you know, the bones of this house are older than you think they are. But all we get in terms of, well, who are the ghosts? Why are they here? Is this supposition that the man of the family, the the head of the household, makes about, well, I guess I, given what I've seen of the ghosts, I can piece together that two of these people were murdering this other person, who any of these people were, why they're murdering this person, why they came out here to do it uh, instead of doing it in the town where people actually lived. I don't know the answers to any of that. No interest in going to figure out any of that. There's no library montage here going back through old newspapers to look for, you know, missing persons, like I would see a, you know, a photograph of that's you know that's the ghost i've seen and get to the bottom of it like this should really just be the 
break between act two and act three or even act one and act two where now we need to go find out who these people are and then what we need to do is figure out how to get them out of here how to satisfy whatever it is that's tethering them to the earth to this place and deal with that but there's no interest in that at all but that should be the mystery right is who are these people why are they ghosts? How do ghosts work? <laughs> right. Uh, it's a huge problem. The, the, the narrator's laziness is just a massive problem in this story. I mean, I'm not even convinced he's an invalid. I think he's just lazy. And the doctors are like, well, you're rich and there's no cure for your laziness. Why not change? change why not like go for a change of scenery? I mean, it's just this scene where he's like, oh, my foot hurt. And I'm sitting by the window next to the door that leads right out to the garden. But the bell is far away. And I have to go get the bell to summon the butler because my foot hurts and I don't want to walk. And it's like, what? Like, that would be a good scene. Like, this guy who's been lazy his whole life is suddenly, like, roused to action through some, like, sense of purpose. He never develops a sense of purpose. He doesn't do anything with his kids like he's he's the worst character i think i've come across in literature in a really long time this like just extreme laziness and lack of motivation is a huge barrier of entry for me in enjoying this story it's his foot that is lame is really all that we're told here but then it turns out his wife's foot also is in bad shape so this to me sounded like gout right which of course historically is an aristocratic disease right you get this from not eating enough fruits and vegetables because you are wealthy enough to just eat meat all the time if you want to. So again, this, this does seem to have a class element to what's happening with them. And it's possible, you know, they've, they've of course also been told to go live by the seaside. So it's quite possible that the, the real prescription the doctor is giving them is, uh, I want you to get off a diet of red meat and onto a diet of fish. Cause that will help clear up your, your gout or something like that. But none of that actually ever amounts to anything. So uh, those are all sorts of the problems. I think we've made a number, I think we've made a pretty good catalog of some of the things that are absent from this story. Let's try to turn this around. Let's, let's try to salvage this story or maybe salvage is not quite the, the right way to put it because I think this story was probably a lot more enjoyable to its contemporary audience than it was to us. So let's think about this in terms of how would we make this a story that would be satisfying to us as readers here in the beginning of the 21st century. What are some things that you would do to change this story, Brandon? Well, I think the first thing I would do is supply any of these characters with a sense of superstition or fear. Uh, one thing uh, we've come to expect in ghost stories is uh, that everybody, all the good, smart, well-educated people are are blind to the reality of their situation because of their education. And so what you need to do is have the superstitious nurse, not the superstitious nurse, be convinced they're ghosts and her being like dismissed or some injustice take place as a result of her superstition that turns out to be true. Just to add some tension or plot or uh, some narrative drive to the story rather than just having a catalog of spooky things dispassionately told to uh, a disinterested audience. Yeah, the tension there could be awesome, right? Because you have the head of household dismiss this woman who's taking care of the kids, right? Because she has this irrational explanation for this thing that's happening in the house. But this old woman does definitely know exactly what's going on because, you know, she's the old folklore woman, right? She's lived in this community her whole life. She maybe even has some sense of who the ghosts are or something like that, or at least she knows how to deal with ghosts, has some idea of how to do that. Now that she's been dismissed, she can no longer do that. But she has become attached to these kids, right? She takes the charge of caring and protecting for these kids so seriously that even though she's been fired from this job, she's going to continue to work to get the kids out of this house or to fix the ghost problem in some way. And this then you know, creates a conflict between her and the head of the house and her as just a poor woman, this guy as a wealthy man, right? So they're totally different status in the community and relationship with the law and so on. We can have a lot of conflict, a lot of act two type conflict there with that. That's a great uh, conflict to throw into the middle of this story. Yeah. I think, I mean, th that's just one thing the story needs is conflict because there is none. Uh, and, and I think, Having uh, a character arc for the head of household would also do a lot to fix this story. It's so 
unsatisfying to get to the end of the story and discover eight years have passed. He knows there is a deeper history to this place than he first imagined. And his response is, uh, well, I, I just kind of forgot to look into it because I'm, I'm really lazy. And that, that's my character trait. And, and to keep that sort of disinterest and laziness as the character trait without allowing the character any growth, without having him roused to action by the fact that strange men are in his children's room and strange women are looking in his children's playground. That doesn't rouse him to action. To have something get him to take an interest in this mystery uh, that would lead him out of his character flaw into some sort of virtue would also go a long way in this story. Nothing is is learned by anyone in this story, right? There is no character arc. There's no character growth at all. There's no lesson to be learned in this story. So the story's not actually about anything. This is a story that is about nothing, but not in the funny Seinfeld way of that, right? There's there's really nothing there's really nothing to sink your teeth into in this story. To be fair to this story, some of this might be because of where it's being published that in fact this might have been what Le Fanu was trying to do. This is not my first Le Fanu story and in fact I'm disappointed that I feel like this was such a clunker because some of his stories like uh Green Tea, Carmilla the the great vampire story. I mean he's written some really amazing stories and actually did a lot to invent a lot of what we think of as the horror genre today. This one seems to have some constraints put on it because it's being published in what is essentially a newspaper. And I wonder if that was Le Fanu's game here, challenging himself as a writer to write a ghost story that's not actually a ghost story, to write a scary story that's not actually scary, to take all of that, the, the narrative elements and all of the emotion out of this story and to actually perpetrate some kind of hoax on readers for some reason, right? It feels like this is the result of a creative writing prompt that someone has given him. Right. He does invoke this other kind of ghost story that apparently was taken on some level to be a hoax or true or or something like that. The apparition of Mrs. Veal. And and it's clear that there's some play between those texts in his mind. He's like, I can maybe write a better hoax than Daniel Defoe, (laughs) but uh, who, who was, you know, another Irish writer. So I wonder if something like that is going on. But I also wonder if this is a maybe a satire of the aristocratic class as well in some way that he he is writing to expose um what he sees as character flaws in the aristocracy i'm sure there are listeners to this podcast who have a, a better sense of, of irish and british history in the victorian period uh and maybe some of the interplays between the uh, laws and texts that Lafanu is working with here and i'd love to hear about them but i i think we've done all we can for today so that's going to do it for this episode. Once again, I'm Brandon Buddha. And I'm Glenn McDorman. You can find us and our other creative projects, as always, at claytemplemedia.com. And that does include our brand new Neil Gaiman podcast called Hanging Out with the Dream King, which uh, we really hope you'll check out. And hey, even if Neil Gaiman isn't your thing, uh, we'd appreciate some signal boost on this. So please let your Gaiman fan friends know about the show. Yeah, please do. And if you enjoy what you're doing, tell your friends about all of our shows. Uh, we we love to have more listeners and more engagement with the work we do here at clay temple media if you're so inclined head over to the clay temple forum and let us know what you thought of this story an authentic narrative of a haunted house give us your thoughts about it give us your ideas of how you would fix this story yeah again i think as we so often do there's an implicit call for some uh, some fan fiction or really just original ghost fiction here we'd love to read that as always this was the, the last story of four that won our most recent Patreon vote. So our Patreon supporters have voted on another batch of stories. So next time we're going to be back with Purity by Thomas Ligotti. And this will be the second entry of Thomas Ligotti into the Elder Sign canon. Uh, really excited for this. But until then, we greet you and say farewell.